record. So, a nice, hi Elena, I didn't get to say hi to you. <laughs> so tonight, the, the topic is um, what is yoga? And really I'm doing this based from the Yoga Sutras. And I'm gonna do a little video as well, like kind of as an introduction to the Yoga Sutras. So um, if you wanna see that on the YouTube channel, you can see that later. Oh, there's Mercedes. She's coming from Venezuela. <laughs> so um, we're gonna start with a breathing as we usually do. I'm gonna keep the same formula. And next, on Wednesdays, it's no difference for you, you guys. Can you do this? If you like the class, is it okay to do it on Wednesdays? Okay, good, good. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna do Kapalabhati. Um, I'm assuming you've all done Kapalabhati. Is there anybody, go like this if you've never done it. So, Leticia, you've never done it. Okay, so, and Celine, you've done Kapalabhati before? Yeah, okay. So Kapalabhati, you're going to put one hand below the navel on the belly. You can't see me, so it's like down here like this. And then the other hand just below the nostrils. And if you already know the practice, you don't need to necessarily do all this. And what you're going to do is you're going to exhale forcefully the air out of the body. So I'm giving you a really quick uh, instruction and it doesn't matter, just um, even if you don't get it 100% right, um, if you really want to know how to do it, then you can see on YouTube, we put some videos on how to do it with uh, details. Um, but for tonight, just kind of go so you're exhaling and you feel the air coming out of the nose and you're kind of pumping the belly, okay? But let's start by first sitting. So sitting quietly with the eyes closed. The spine elongated. The shoulders relaxed, the face relaxed, and then starting to bring your awareness inside. Noticing the inner vibration of the body. You have the sense that you can feel the body from the inside out. So first noticing the inner body. And then start to connect with the breath. So first just noticing your natural breathing pattern. Notice if the breath is moving freely, easily, naturally. If it feels like there's any constraints somewhere or it feels kind of choppy, then what you can do is deepen the inhales, deepen the exhales. So making them a little longer, even using the sound of ujjayi until the breath feels a little calmer, the body, the mind all follow, so that everything feels just a little bit calmer, especially if you came running to the class or you have a lot on your mind. You may take just a few more moments to feel a little more settled. We're going to do three rounds of Kapalabhati. So three rounds, about I would say 20 to 30 pumps. Take a couple breaths in between and then do the second one, 20 or 30 pumps and do three total. And for those of you who need instruction, I'm going to go through the details. So you bring one hand below the navel, 
the other hand below the nostrils. Exhale fully from the bottom, like you're exhaling the air out first from the lower abdomina, abdominals and then all the way up. And then inhale through the lungs. Try to keep the pelvic floor engaged. And then exhale, pumping the lower belly. Exhale. And then the last one. Release the hands, come back to a natural breath. And when you're ready, going for the second round. So you can either keep the hands there or if you can understand the pumping of the belly, you don't need the hands there. Counting on your own, 20 to 30 rounds. Some of the the aims are to have the, the rhythm of the belly so that the rhythm is equal to make sure you don't get dizzy. If you get dizzy, you stop to make sure the belly stays relaxed in between exhales. And if you lose count, then you stop and you start over. If you finish, just stay sitting. Start to control the inhales and the exhales, so making them slightly longer. Adding the sound. Seeing if you can make the inhales and the exhales the same length. And bring the hands in front of the chest. And then rubbing the hands together, warming up the palms, and placing the hands over the eyes, opening the eyes behind the palms. And then slowly releasing the eyes. So, so we're going to go in order of the sutras now. So sutra 1-1. One, one. So if you happen to have a, I should have told you it could have been useful to bring a sutra book with you. So if you happen to have one, you can open it up to sutra 1-1. One, one. And I'll read it out. So it's Atta Yoga Anushasanam. Okay, don't quote me in pronunciation, okay, because I am really not good with languages. You know, one language, English, is already enough for me. I sometimes have trouble pronouncing things. So um, um, if you want the, a closer pronunciation, you can see on my Instagram channel, I've been putting Gerald chanting them, and he's a little bit better at it than I am. But I'm going to go through the words. So what does Atta mean? Atta, it means now. Okay, so we're bringing ourselves into the present moment, to the now. Yoga, okay, I'm going to for now just translate it as yoga. And then Anushasanam means exposition or instruction. 
So basically this sutra means now starts yoga instruction. So it's just an introduction to what is to come. Like here we are, we're gonna sit here and we're gonna study yoga. Um, then sutra one, two, yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodaha. So the first word yoga, I'm gonna explain a little later. Chitta, so what is chitta? Chitta is the consciousness. And so when we talk about consciousness, um, we're talking about consciousness with a small C, not the big C. And this um, is composed of three parts. So the ahamkara, which means the I. So I am Linda, I am female, I am Canadian and French and you know like it's how we identify ourselves so we will say ego but it's not the ego in the sense that we use it in the West where it's a negative thing it just is we all have ego and sometimes it's a skill you know sometimes it's a bigger ego sometimes a lower ego you know it's just the identification with the I Okay, so it's not the same like we, we think of. So it's all called ahamkara. And then manas, which is sometimes translated as the lower mind. So this is the mind that is, um, it's uh, sent outwards through the senses. So we, we hear, we see, we smell, we touch. So it's the part of the mind that is part of like desires, for example, or, you know, aversion. You know, it's that part of the mind. It's what we, how we see the world through the senses, basically. And then there's buddhi, which means the higher mind. So this is the intellect. So I think this is a little more difficult to explain. Um, I would say the way I understand it is that there's the true self and then we come through. And so I would say the higher mind is closer to intuition, higher knowledge and um, yeah, intuition, higher knowledge or intellect. So it's not as swayed by the external world. Still swayed, but it's not as swayed. Does that make some sense? A little bit? <laughs> okay, and then vritti. What does vritti mean? Vritti means fluctuation. It comes from this uh, root vrit, which means to whirl. So I like to think of vritti as whirls. So basically whirls of consciousness, whirls of the mind. So when we are, like, we think about our mind when it's spinning, right? I don't know, like I feel like my mind is sometimes it's just like spin, right? It's just going and going. It goes from one thought to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, right? When we try to settle, it doesn't want to settle. So whirls of the mind. And then nirodaha can be translated as restraint. Sometimes cessation, stop, control. I like restraint because it's not necessarily, um, it's not so black and white. It's not stopping of the mind. It's more like I'm going to restrain it because I have some skills now that I'm allowed, I allow my mind to settle. I allow my mind to focus. Different so we can kind of um, control the mind, but not in a harsh controlling way. So you could translate that whole phrase as yoga is the restraint of the fluctuation or the whirls of consciousness or the mind, right? Um, so then we come to yoga. So what is yoga? So, because Patanjali describes yoga more in the way he explains how to get to yoga. But yoga is, if you look at the root of yoga, it means to yoke. So it's to union, it's to bring things together, okay? Um, so basically here it's used as a word to describe a discipline that is used to bring some things together or to come into oneness, right? So um, I like to have very 
Like when I think about the Yoga Sutras, I like to have layered um, descriptions so that it isn't yoga, it doesn't mean yoga equals this and it's very black and white. This is what it is and this is all that it is and anything else you're doing is not yoga. I like to think of having layers because then we can bring it to the now, where I am right now. Um, so basically the entire science of yoga is based on this sutra. If we could just understand this sutra and no other, we and understand from the inside, we wouldn't need to read any of the other sutras. So um, yoga, and I like to say it like this too, yoga is trying to calm the whirling noise of the mind, right? The mind is noisy, it's whirling around, feels like there's like a tornado sometimes happening in there. And so trying to calm those whirls. And for me, this brings me more to a way I can use this yoga for now, for today, for in my daily life, with my kids, with your jobs, uh, with your friends, with your partners, you know, and doesn't make it just something that is this esoteric way of looking at it that sounds all beautiful, but feels like, uh, I just, I can't relate. I can't go there. I'm never going to be able to get there. Like if I, when I go further, we'll talk about the other sutras, but if yoga is union of the union with the soul or the Purusha or the, the divine, this might just sound like, too overwhelming for us to think about and then we don't even take the first step on yoga. Does that make sense? Whereas if we can bring it to our daily life then we can take step one, step two, step three, step four and we work towards somewhere where then oh yeah maybe union with the divine actually seems like something possible. Right? So so eventually we will bring it to some higher meaning or some higher states. Um, I just think about myself when I started yoga, that just, it was just, it was way miles over my head, right? You know, there was just no way I could get there. It was already enough just to concentrate reading a book. You know, I would read a page, I would get to the end of the page and forget what I read at the beginning. You know, so if I was having trouble with that kind of simple concentration, then I needed to work on this kind of thing first, right? So, yeah, so for now we're going to bring the teaching to our day-to-day -day life. And we, use, we can use this teaching as a way to calm and steady our minds. So, um, on that, in that sense, when we look at it this way, um, you could almost say that everything that settles or concentrates the mind is yoga, right? Do you see what I mean? And what's interesting, if you look at that way of looking at it, the enlightened beings understand that this is all yoga, right? An enlightened person that, like I think about somebody like uh, Ramana Maharishi, Everything he saw, all of it was yoga, all was one. And there was no dualism, right? Everything around us that we would consider as dirty, um, harmful, um, you know, anger, all of these things that we put into a dual place, the holy enlightened person doesn't see it that way. It's all one, right? The divine is everywhere. So if we can start with understanding that anything that settles our mind or helps us concentrate our mind is yoga, is a yoga, could be used and looked at as a yogic discipline. So um, practices that teach us to bring our focus to the task at hand because how often are we having a conversation with a friend and we're thinking about, oh, you know, what we are gonna say next, you know, to the response to whatever they're talking about. Or, you know, you're with your kids reading a story, 
you know, I've done this. I can read a story out loud to the kids and still be thinking about what I have to do later. Like, it's just amazing. And so then I'm just reading and I don't even know what I'm reading about. So I feel like I'm doing the duty to read to my child, but in fact, it's not really pure with them. You know, and I think ultimately they feel the difference when mommy's right there and present and seeing them for who they are, or mommy's saying yes, 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 but mommy's thinking about something else, right? So this is a way to practice yoga. So when you're with your child or with your friend or your partner, anybody you're with, you see them, who they are, even passing people on the street. I've noticed that in where we're living, people have become so much friendlier. You know, they all have their masks on and you can see the eyes. People are trying to look at each other because I think we're craving connection with other human beings. And so when you look at another person and you see the other person, this is a form of yoga because you're in the now, you're seeing that person there. So, some ways that we traditionally look at yoga disciplines are yoga asana, right? Yoga postures, yoga pran pranayama, different ways of breathing, um, dhyana, which means meditation. So different methods of meditation, um, dharana, which is different methods of um, concentration, pratyahara, different ways to withdraw the senses. Those are all kind of more the traditional ways of practicing yoga. But you could also say that I use the example of reading. You know, I'm going to read and I'm going to be present. As soon as I lose my presence, I'm going to go and I'm going to start over, right? This is a meditation. It's what you do when you have a point of meditation, your object of meditation, as you're concentrating on it, as soon as the mind goes, you just gently bring it back, you know, with no admonishment, no criticism, no judgment. So the same when you're reading a story. Um, cooking, right? If you're really cooking, you're going to be present as you, you know, peel the carrots or whatever you're doing. Garden work. Garden work is super meditative. You know, you're just taking care of nature. This is, this is healing. Um, taking a bath, right? Taking a bath, and while you're having your bath, practice having an attentive and a um, calm mind. You know, aware and attentive, and at the same time calm and peaceful. So um, sometimes I find that we, as especially yoga teachers, are probably more are worse at this than yoga practitioners um, do this more where we can be very judgmental you know in the world of yoga that this is yoga what they're doing over there that yoga studio that's not yoga right they have loud music they're sweating too much they you know and so we get kind of it's a shame because we divide ourselves even within the yoga community, which is kind of ironic. And I've been like, I'm totally guilty of it. <laughs> you know, I'm not, to, you know, the only reason I think about it is because I've recognized myself in doing this kind of thing. And I'm like, but Linda, this doesn't make any sense. If you're really doing yoga, then you're not going to judge what another style of yoga is calling yoga, right? Like goat yoga. <laughs> had to add a little sarcasm in there. <laughs> um, but yeah, we get caught up in this is the real yoga, this is not yoga. But I really firmly believe that there is a yoga out there for everybody. And um, I think we all need to start exactly from where we are right now, not somewhere else. If you really want to honor yourself and you want to honor the, those around you, you also let them start from wherever they are with no judgment. There is, I believe every single person in this world is on the path of yoga, whether they know it or not, because we're, we're joining with the divine. And if you think about it kind of in a not nice way, but when we die, right, the body dies, where does it die? Where does the body go? I think it merges back in with the divine, 
right? And then there's a part, there's the Purusha, there's a little part of us that has our karma, samskaras, our vasanas, all these aspects of ourself that go and get transmitted with the, you know, our Purusha, our soul, which is also part of the, you know, the greater divine. And then it gets that recycled into another, you know, physical life form, like the Prakriti. So, um, if you see the world like this, that means that every single person is on a path of yoga. Does that make sense? Even if it doesn't resemble it at all to us from the outside, they, they are. And it just will keep on, if you look at our world now, even with this crisis and everything, versus, you know, 500 years ago, we were a more awakened society. Right? It doesn't, you know, you know, that's a whole nother subject because it might not look like it, but if you really investigate, you see that we are more awake than we were as a whole than 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. So, so for instance, so going back to what is yoga and um, the different ways to um, do a yoga practice. So for instance, if you have a very busy, active, scattered mind, it's not gonna be possible to just sit and be quiet. You might be able to sit and look like you're in some sort of like Zen pose, but the mind is just going and going and going and going and going and going. I've seen myself like sit and practice my yoga, my meditation practice, and all I've done is planned my whole day. <laughs> you know, and so it's like being a great opportunity to sit and figure things out, and then I feel like, wow, that was like so, <laughs> you know, so useful, right? And then I get up and I'm ready for my day, and then I'm like, wait a second, Linda, no, come back, you know. So, but some days it's just not possible. I keep bringing myself back, and then before I know it, oh yeah, but I, you know, I still forgot to email that person. Okay bring it back oh yeah yeah you know and this is the practice it's just the practice so um, if your mind is very busy and active like that I feel like there it can be useful to have other noise to kind of um, bring you to focus on that specific noise so thinking of something like a very dynamic yoga class with loud music because us Ashtangis can be kind of um, arrogant when thinking about those kinds of uh, yoga practices that, you know, Ashtanga yoga, you practice in silence, it's self-practice, the teacher doesn't talk, it's just hands-on and, and all that. And so that we can kind of be elitist in this way. Guilty, 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 <laughs> right? Um, but then when you start to think, well, and especially if you've been teaching for a long time, because I've heard friends that I like say, you have to do this practice, it's the best practice. And then they just freak out because they have to see themselves. It's too much for them to come into a silent practice. So it's better for them to go to a more maybe dynamic, sweaty, loud music practice to just bring them to a certain amount of silence in their mind. Does that make sense? It's like, um, instead of thinking about all your problems, at least you're in a room, you're kind of being distracted somehow, you know, to um, let go of all those problems. And it feels, it brings you to a place where you feel a little bit better. Has anybody experienced that? Taking some kind of class that, you know, dance class. Dance class would be a great one. You know, you, you go into dance class and you're thinking about all your problems and you come, you, while you're doing your dance class, you're just focused on that, right? And it does give you this sense of uh, well-being, right? So, or thinking about really advanced asanas, it's the same thing. When you do a very, very difficult asana, you can't think about other things because you're so concentrated on your balance or not getting hurt or, you know, you have to be really present in what you're doing. 
So this is because um, some people say that, you know, the critics of Ashtanga yoga, for example, will say that's not really yoga because it's just gymnastic, it's just circus. But maybe this is what we need for some time because I found for me, it's really helped me to, okay, I really need to concentrate on this practice. I get in my body and then slowly, slowly over the years, I don't need as much you know, of that, that kind of thing, right? Because I can find the advancedness in a very simple pose now. But try to ask me to do that 20 years ago, it just went over my head. You know, I took classes with Richard Freeman and it, you know, things, it would take me two years after I'd be like, oh, that's what he meant there. Because I wasn't ready at the time, right? So basically that's a teaching just to not define yoga too narrowly. And what happens when you are practicing these kinds of practices that are kind of distracting us in some ways is that um, we are changing our neural pathways in our brain. So even if I'm concentrating on a very advanced asana, I'm still training my brain to concentrate on something. Does that make sense? Okay. Because I can't concentrate on anything else without falling out of the pose or injuring myself. So I'm putting my neural pathways together so that when I come off my yoga mat, hopefully those connections help me to be able to concentrate on my job, concentrate on my relationship, concentrate on, you know, whatever you may be doing in your day. Does that make sense? Yes? No? If it doesn't, I can try other ways to explain. <laughs> okay. Um, because they say our brain is plastic and it also teaches us to learn to stay within the discomfort, right? Because when we feel discomfort, what do we usually do? Me, I run to cookies. Cookies are great for, <laughs> you know, <laughs> taking care of discomfort or cashews. This is now my latest thing, you know, because I try not to do, try not to eat the bad thing. So I eat cashews. Okay. So, but it doesn't really help you. So if you learn to stay more and more often, then you can experience it and you can handle the situations in a more skillful way. Not always, but more often, right? Um, and so, yeah, so, I was saying that you can take those skills to other activities like listening to a friend. So you're present with your friend. You don't just change the subject to yourself, you know, like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what I did yesterday, right? You can be present with that friend, um, concentrating at work. I said already, um, be more, being more attentive while cooking, bathing, walking, um, being less rushing, you know, rushing a little bit less and then also less out of it because when I think about a bath for instance or a shower it's not just necessarily zoning out right because not that that's bad and that's very useful especially if we just need to completely release and rest and let go of everything this is great but um, if you want to create this level of concentration then it can't be dull, right? Because dullness is one of the obstacles to mental clarity. Okay, they're in the Yoga Sutras, it's called the Vikshepas. So the Vikshepas, the Vikshepas, um, so the dullness is one of those, which is an obstacle to mental clarity. Does that make sense? I saw some confused faces. Oh, okay, and so this is called um, stiana, stiana, dullness. So then we can go into Sutra 1 3. So this is Tada, Drashtu, Swarupe, Vashtanam. So Tada, it means then. And I love that word because I don't know, I haven't researched it, but isn't it like Tada, right? Because the seer, drashtu, is the seer. 
So it's like, ta-da, the seer is present in its full essence. I don't know, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? Like as soon as you see that, um, that sutra wrote, written like that, you completely just understand. It's so clear. It doesn't become this very weird, esoteric thing that makes no sense to you. No? It's like, ta-da, now I'm in my true essence. Right? When you clear away the clutter, you're going to be fully authentic and natural in resting in the divine. So um, you could, so Swarupe is own essence or own nature. Uh, Vashtanam means abiding. So then seer, own essence, abiding. Because Sanskrit doesn't make sense. So that's why we have to re formulate the sentence so it makes sense to us. So then the seer abides in its own essence. So you're no longer lost in confusion. You understand who you really are, right? So the practice of yoga, the practice of union brings you to understand exactly who you really are. And you are not your thoughts. You are not your emotions. You are not your body. You are not the owner of that house. You are not a yoga teacher. You're not named Linda. You're not, you know, this age or that age, that nationality, this nationality. You're none of those things. The reality is that you're something greater than all of that, right? So when we understand who we really are, then we can feel a certain amount of contentness the mind becomes more quiet, not dull. It sees, right? Because the seer is, we, the seer uses the, the mind to perceive the world around it, right? But it gets all covered up by all those, all that craziness and hecticness and chaos. And then we don't see this, we don't recognize the essence or the authenticity, right? It's covered up. But when, I think when we are fully enlightened, so not me, okay? <laughs> Sometimes it's weird to talk about these things because I don't want to give people the impression that I, I understand maybe, but I don't necessarily experience, okay? So my understanding would be that if I was able to be completely present in that I am part of the divine, then I'm not, I'm going to be able to float through that world in complete peace no matter what the storm is around me. Doesn't mean I wouldn't act, but I'm going to act from this very pure place. So I'm not going to have jealousy, envy, I'm not going to hurt people, I'm not going to be able to tell lies, um, you know, all these kinds of things, right? So you're acting from your true self. So we could look at that as layers too. When we, when we um, connect to our authentic self, then I'm going to be more apt to say things like, you know, like, um, you know, for instance, one of my little struggles at the moment, it's not really a little struggle, but it's a big struggle, is whether the yoga studio is ever going to be able to open again. You know, and then even if it is able to open, do I really want to go to through that? You know, like is for how stressful it might be, do I really want to be a yoga studio manager, owner, or do I just want to be a yoga teacher? You know, and so this is something that I'm going through right now because if it really means a huge, huge struggle, like starting from almost zero. I'm kind of over it, you know, like I've done that for 18 years and um, I don't really want to go there. So it's my inner play at the moment. So if I follow my, I have to really listen to my essence and my deep self, my authenticity, because if I decide to go somewhere where I'm not following my authentic self, then I'm not going to be happy. 
and then I'm gonna blame other people for my unhappiness. It's gonna be, you know, students' fault for not coming to the class, teachers' fault for not teaching the way I said, or you know, like whatever. You know, you're gonna get lost in all all that stuff. So I'm sure you can all recognize in your own lives different places, like in a relationship, for instance. Are you do you really wanna be in that relationship? Because if you really don't want to be there from your true self, then same thing. You're going to be picking on this, picking on that, blaming for this, you know, fighting about that. Whereas if you really are authentic, you want that relationship, you're going to be a little less likely to get into those kind of petty games, right? But it's not easy, right? I'm not saying that's easy, it's just it's an intellectual understanding and then putting it into practice is a whole different place. Okay, so um, that's, I think that's what I was going to stop at for now, um, unless there's any specific questions. Do you have any questions about those three sutras? Does it make sense? Sort of. So when I did the talk on self-worth and loneliness, I did a little me meditation on um, imagining that in the mind there was a body of water. And in the, so kind of, I, when I imagine it, because I love to do this on my myself and I find that it just really helps me. Um, settle because I imagine that I have this kind of body of water cutting cutting through my skull like that and this body of water it's starting like either it's moving a lot um, really fast movements and this is when my mind is really whirling and thinking a lot and busy mind this kind of thing or sometimes it's just sitting there but it's really heavy thick like muddy water. And this is more like when I'm feeling like depressed, over it, sad, um, you know, dull, not wanting to get up, you know, these kinds of um, feelings uh, or thought patterns. So um, either way, you don't want those states of mind. And so then what I do is I imagine that the water starts to settle. So it becomes more, less fast if it's fast, and then all the sediment starts to settle. So all the sand or dirt in the mind, it starts to settle. And then as it settles, I notice that the water starts to be clear, right? Nice crystal clear water, like the best beach in the world, right? And then when you have that super clear water, then it also has a reflection, right? Because fast moving water is harder to see the reflection or really, you know, gray, deep, you know, muddy water, it's harder to reflect what's above. But when it's very clear, then it reflects the blue, bright blue sky. And so when I do this meditation, it gives me that sense of settling the mind but also you feel this kind of tingling all in the top of the skull. So the mind settles to more like the brainstem, I would say, right? Everybody knows the brainstem. So it settles down there and then the top, the skull, it starts to tingle and you feel like you're part of the universe, right? So the meditation I find really interesting and it's kind of, it's one of those Indian myths like they use to describe this sutra and the seer. So the seer can only really truly see when that has settled. And so when all that sediment has settled, you see the depth of the mind at the same time as seeing all. Does that make sense? Yes? <laughs> okay, so I wanted to do that meditation again, but I wanted to take the chance to explain why this meditation can be interesting for, for all of us. Any questions? Does it make sense? 
Yeah? Okay. So let's start sitting again. So make sure you're sitting up on something so that the spine can be elongated. One of these days we'll do um, chakra talk, but the subtle body is within the spine. So you want to have that pathway so that the flow of energy moves smoothly. And then close the eyes. So feel like your pelvis feels heavy, grounded. The legs feel relaxed and grounded. Elongating the spine from the pelvis. Feel like you're growing up towards the sky. The head is centered on top of the spine so that it feels light. So you're able to relax the back of the neck, relax the shoulders, relax the arms. So the legs can take the weight of the arms. Relaxing the jaw. The teeth are not touching inside the mouth. They're just ever so slightly apart while the lips still stay together. See if you can feel like you're relaxing the palate, the top, the roof of the mouth. Gives you a sense of expansion. Relaxing the lips, the cheeks over the nose, relaxing the eyes, the eyelids, relaxing behind the eyes. Allowing the eyeball just to settle down, down towards the nose, or if it's better for you, up towards the third eye. And if you have that steady inner gaze. inside the torso. Notice if there's any kind of tension or anxiety. Notice the vibration of the body if it's very subtle. Feel like you need to calm it a little bit more. Start to do rhythmic breathing with a soft sound of ujjayi. So making the inhales and the exhales a little bit longer. Making a soft sound. to make the inhales and the exhales the same length.
you start to feel more calm in the body. Start to allow the breath to become quieter and quieter. No more controlling of the breath. Less and less movement with the breath. Start to bring your imagination to inside the skull. And notice that that body of water. Notice what state it is in. Maybe it's still whirling about. Maybe it's very cloudy. Maybe it's just slightly cloudy. Start to notice if you can imagine that the, the water is becoming more still less whirls, like there's no wind anywhere, there's no current anywhere. And as the water becomes more still, All the sediment starts to fall, fall to the bottom. It's settling in the deepest part of the mind. Or even just disappearing altogether. that that body of water now is clear. Just imagining the clearest, bluest water you can imagine. No movement still. And with that stillness, on the surface of the water, you can reflect what's about. beautiful blue sky. Can you feel, feel that beautiful blue sky filling the top of the head? Thoughts have been settled. At the same time, feel attentive, clear. The mind is completely. 
completely clear. starts to rise, they pass through to the road to gently settle back down or disappear. There's no judgment, pure compassion and understanding. Bring the hands in front of the chest, maintaining that clear, attentive, relaxed mind. And you can chant Om Shanti. Thank you, everybody.